This is the fifth and final video in this series on pulmonary function tests. In this video, I'll be summarizing the most important and high yield learning points of the preceding four videos. I'll then review some practice cases, which will include a brief clinical vignette and chest x-ray, along with the PFT report. In addition to the general review, specific learning objectives from the practice cases are first, to be able to identify a likely category of lung disease from a PFT report, and second, to be able to hypothesize a specific etiology of lung disease by synthesizing PFTs with a clinical history and chest radiograph. Hopefully this image is familiar to you. It demonstrates the various lung volumes labeled on the left and the capacities labeled on the right. One of the three most clinically important values is the total lung capacity, which as the term implies is the maximum volume of air contained within the lungs during the deepest possible inspiration. The two remaining of the three most clinically important values are determined when a patient inhales as deeply as possible and then forcefully exhales as quickly as possible. The vital capacity as measured during this maneuver is called the forced vital capacity or FVC. The volume of air exhaled during the first second of that maneuver is called the forced expiratory volume in one second, abbreviated FEV1 and the ratio of the FEV1 over the FVC is a critical measure of obstruction to airflow during expiration. Here's a chart of how the FEV1, FVC, and FEV1 to FVC ratio can help to classify lung diseases into the classic, though simplistic, dichotomy of obstruction versus restriction. The hallmark of obstructive lung disease is that the FEV1 to FVC ratio is reduced below 70%, the hallmark of restrictive lung disease is that this ratio is either normal or increased with a decrease in the FVC. Occasionally, there will be important diagnostic data from PFTs that is difficult to appreciate from a table of numbers and is easier to appreciate from something called the flow volume loop, which is a graph of airflow as a function of the volume of air within the lungs. When there is obstruction present, there is an inward bowing of the upper expiratory limb of the loop known as coving. The more severe the obstruction, the more reduced the peak expiratory flow rate, and the more likely the FVC will also be reduced. When there is restriction present, there is no coving, and instead the loop will be markedly reduced in size, mostly on account of a reduction in FVC. The breakdown of lung volumes can also be insightful. As compared to normal, most patients with obstructive lung disease have a proportionally increased residual volume and total lung capacity with relative preservation of other lung volumes and vital capacity. In restrictive lung disease, all lung volumes and vital capacity are reduced. Finally, in a minority of patients with severe obstruction, the residual volume is so great that it starts to crowd out the other volumes, so to speak, leading to a reduction in vital capacity even as the total lung volume is increased. This is frequently referred to as pseudo-restriction because if a patient only receives spirometry, which does not measure residual volume, he or she will appear to have restriction due to the low vital capacity. Only if all lung volumes are measured would the true status of severe obstruction be revealed. Finally, in addition to spirometry and lung volumes, the other major component of complete PFTs is a measurement of the DLCO, which is a measure of how easily carbon monoxide moves from the alveoli into the capillaries. General etiologies of a reduced DLCO include decreased alveolar capillary membrane surface area, as occurs in emphysema, an increase in membrane thickness, as occurs in interstitial lung disease, pulmonary hypertension for more complex reasons, and anemia due to the fact that anemic blood has a lower carrying capacity for carbon monoxide. An increased DLCO is generally not a clinically relevant finding, but etiologies include exercise, supine position, asthma, pulmonary hemorrhage, and polycythemia. Here's an extremely simplified overview of the interpretation of PFTs. If the FEB1 to FVC ratio is reduced, the patient has obstruction.
if the total lung capacity is reduced, the patient has restriction, and if both are reduced, the patient has both obstruction and restriction, often labeled a mixed defect. And finally, the last slide of this review is this more comprehensive algorithm for using PFTs in the diagnosis of chronic lung disease. I will not review the details, but feel free to pause this and copy it down because if there's only one image to remember from this whole video series, it's probably this one. The one thing I will discuss in this chart is this distinction down here. In patients with obstructive lung disease, in the last video, I suggested that the DLCO can help distinguish those with a predominantly emphysematous subtype of COPD from those with a predominantly chronic bronchitic subtype. However, I'd like to emphasize that as most COPD patients have manifestations of both subtypes, almost all patients with COPD have low DLCO, even when they have airway inflammation. I'll now present five practice cases. For each case, you'll receive a clinical vignette with a chief complaint and physical exam, along with complete PFTs. Four of the five cases will also have a corresponding chest x-ray. For each case, you should first attempt to identify the general category of lung disease from the PFTs, such as obstruction, restriction, mixed, or vascular. And then using the history and x-ray, you should hypothesize a specific diagnosis or combination of diagnoses which seems to be the most likely explanation for the patient's presentation. You may need to intermittently pause the video to give yourself enough time to review the PFTs and to think through the case. Case 1. A 56-year-old man with a history of smoking presents with a progressive, productive cough and dyspnea over three months. On exam, he appears comfortable. Vitals are notable for a respiratory rate of 24 and O2 saturation of 95% on room air. He has diminished sounds throughout both lungs. Here are his PFTs. And here is his chest x-ray. You may want to pause the video here to assess the data yourself and attempt to come up with both a general category of lung disease this patient likely has based on the PFTs, as well as a most likely diagnosis, which incorporates the history, exam, and chest x-ray. So remember that the first step in our diagnostic algorithm when interpreting PFTs is to examine the FEV1 to FVC ratio. If it's low, it means the patient must have obstructive lung disease and may or may not also have restrictive lung disease. Theoretically, they may also have vascular disease as well, so we'll include that here for the sake of completeness. If the FEV1 to FVC ratio is normal or high, the patient may possibly have either restriction and or vascular lung disease, or their lungs may be totally normal. In the case of this patient here, Mr. Stark, the FEV1 to FVC ratio is reduced. The predicted value given his age, gender, and height is apparently 82%, but in actuality, this patient's ratio is reduced at 52%. From this, we know that the patient has at least obstructive lung disease. The next step is assessment of FVC. If it's normal or high, it confirms that only obstruction is present. If FVC is low, then the total lung capacity should be assessed. If that's normal or high, the patient has the pseudo-restriction pattern of obstruction. And finally, if the total lung capacity is low, the patient has mixed lung disease, meaning both obstruction and restriction. In this patient's case, if we look at the FVC, we see that it's reduced. And if we look at the TLC, we see that it is elevated. Therefore, the patient has obstructive lung disease only, and more specifically, the pseudo-restriction variant of obstructive lung disease. Obstruction is confirmed in the flow volume loop by the coving in the expiratory limb. So what specific diagnosis does the patient likely have? Remember that he presented with three months of progressive cough and dyspnea, and his lung exam was notable for diminished sounds, and that he was a smoker. Finally, here is his chest x-ray again. If you haven't had much practice examining x-rays, you may not appreciate that these lungs are just a little bit blacker than normal and the diaphragms are relatively flattened, consistent with the hyperinflation seen in the lung volumes from the PFTs. So in summary, the patient is a smoker with chronic respiratory symptoms, soft lung sounds on exam, PFTs consistent with obstructive lung disease, 
and a chest x-ray with hyperinflation. The diagnosis here is chronic obstructive lung disease, or COPD. I'll move through the next four cases a little bit more quickly. Case 2, a 32-year-old animal trainer, presents with a progressive dry cough and dyspnea over the past month. Her exam is notable for a respiratory rate of 28, O2 sat of 88% on room air, and fine crackles throughout both lungs. Here's her chest x-ray. And pause the video for as long as necessary to analyze the case. So the first step in interpreting the PFTs is what is the FEV1 to FVC ratio. We see here that it is elevated, which rules out obstruction. The next step is to check the FVC. It's severely reduced. The combination of an elevated FEV1 to FVC ratio and a reduced FVC is highly suggestive of restrictive lung disease, which is then confirmed by looking at the total lung capacity and seeing that it's reduced as well. So our patient has restrictive lung disease. When trying to narrow it down to intrapulmonary versus extrapulmonary restriction, the DLCO is very helpful. If the DLCO is low, it is indicative of impairment in gas exchange and thus an intrapulmonary problem. If the DLC is normal, it is strongly suggestive that the lung parenchyma is normal and that the restriction has an extrapulmonary etiology such as neuromuscular weakness or obesity. In this patient, the DLCO is low, so her restriction is most likely some form of interstitial lung disease. Regarding her specific diagnosis, the interstitial lung diseases are very complicated and a full discussion of them are well beyond the scope of this video. However, given her job as an animal trainer, where she's likely exposed to many different types of antigens, and her chest x-ray showing a diffuse reticulonodular pattern with a slight peripheral predominance, my major concern would be a disease called hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is due to a pronounced allergic response to an inhaled allergen, among which feathers and bird droppings are among the more frequent sources, along with various molds commonly found on farms. Case 3. A 15-year-old boy with a history of spinal cord injury presents with dyspnea for two months. He is in mild respiratory discomfort with a respiratory rate of 26 and an O2 sat of 92%. This case has no accompanying x-ray to evaluate, but if it did, it would only show moderately reduced lung volumes. When it comes to interpretation, as usual, start with the FEV1 to FVC ratio, which in this case is normal. However, the FVC is mildly reduced, suggesting the presence of restriction, confirmed by the mildly reduced TLC. So the patient has restrictive lung disease. So what makes this case different than the previous one? Look at the DLCO. It's normal. A normal DLCO in the presence of restriction is suggested that the etiology of restriction is extrapulmonary. In this case, the patient most likely has difficulty inhaling due to his spinal cord injury. An interesting related finding is the combination of the hypoxemia with a normal DLCO. If the DLCO is a measure of the function of the alveolar capillary membrane, and thus a surrogate for gas exchange, and if the DLCO is normal, why would the patient be hypoxemic? The only possible conclusion is that the patient is severely hypoventilating. In hypoventilation, even if gas exchange across the alveolar capillary membrane is functioning normally, if the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli becomes too high on account of the patient not exhaling as efficiently, there must necessarily be less oxygen in the alveoli to breathe in. Therefore, we can conclude further that the patient's PaCO2 that is, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arteries is likely very elevated, and the patient probably has an acidemia in which the pH of arterial blood is lower than normal. Case 4. A 41-year-old woman with no significant past medical history presents with dyspnea for two months. Her exam is notable for a heart rate of 104, an O2 saturation of 87% on room air, a soft systolic murmur at the left lower sternal border, and an elevated JVP. And here is her x-ray. 
So the FVB1 to FVC ratio is normal, and the FVC is normal. This means that the patient has normal lung mechanics. And in fact, if you look at all of the measured spirometry and lung volume numbers, every single one is normal. And the flow volume loop conforms perfectly to the silhouette of the normal for comparison. So I guess this patient has no problems then. Well, unfortunately, look at her DLCO. Very reduced. What does it mean when the lung mechanics are normal but DLCO is low? It suggests the patient has vascular lung disease. Looking at her chest x-ray, to some people it might look relatively normal. However, she has unusually prominent hyla here, which in this case is due to dilated pulmonary arteries. So putting this all together, the patient has pulmonary hypertension, which at this stage in the diagnostic workup could be due to either primary pulmonary hypertension or secondary to an autoimmune disease such as lupus or secondary to chronic thromboembolic disease in which a patient accumulates numerous small pulmonary emboli over time. In addition, if we return to the history and exam just for a moment, we are reminded of her abnormal cardiac findings. What's the explanation for those? This patient doesn't just have pulmonary hypertension, but also appears to have developed right-sided heart failure as well. And here's the final case. A 48-year-old man with a history of smoking presents with chronic progressive dyspnea and leg swelling. On exam, he is obese with a room air saturation of 87% and body mass index significantly elevated at 35. He has diminished lung sounds, elevated JVP, and moderate bilateral pinning edema in the legs. And the chest x-ray. So the FEV1 to FVC is low, so the patient has obstruction. And both the FVC and the TLC are low, so the patient must have restriction as well. So this is an example of a mixed defect seen when obstruction and restriction coexist. Finally, looking at the DLCO, we see that it is very mildly diminished, much less so than the patient's significant hypoxemia of 87%, which suggests it should be. Interpreting DLCO in patients with mixed defects is difficult, if not impossible, because you don't know if a decrease is due to the obstructive component or restrictive component. However, in this case, the severity of hypoxemia is out of proportion to the decrease in DLCO, which strongly suggests that hypoventilation is playing a major role here. Hypoventilation is also consistent with the low lung volumes on x-ray. So in summary, we have an obese smoker presenting with both obstruction and restriction with a low DLCO, but hypoxemia out of proportion to that, as well as signs of right heart failure on exam. This patient actually has a combination of findings that were seen in cases 1, 3, and 4. The obstructive component is almost certainly from COPD, and while it's less certain, the restrictive component is more likely from obesity than from intrinsic lung disease. Although the DLCO is reduced, as noted a second ago, the reduction is mild and it's probably from the COPD. Additional supporting evidence of a lack of interstitial lung disease is also the clear lung fields on x-ray. So that concludes this video series on the interpretation of pulmonary function tests. I hope you found it interesting and useful. If so, please remember to give it a thumbs up and to share it with your classmates and colleagues.